last session we read hadith number 20 and translated the hadith hadith number 20 <coughs> is just to give you the overview of the hadith again is narrated by Sayyiduna Abu Sa'id Sa'ad ibn Malik, Malik ibn Sinan al-Khudri radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma he says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, one day was speaking to the Sahaba, delivering the sermon, the khutbah, the wa'az. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned a man from the previous nations, probably the Bani Israel. A man from the previous nations. And this man had murdered 99 people. And then <clears throat> he was overcome with remorse and regret. And he wanted to do tawbah and return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then he asked the people regarding the most learned person of the land. And the people uh, directed him towards a rahib, a abid, a worshipful servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Assuming that he was, as well as being an abid, he is also an alim. So this man went to the rahib and told him, that he had murdered 99 people and that can he do tawbah can he do tawbah and the rahib said to him no how can you do tawbah now you've killed 99 people how are you going to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now and he out of anger he killed him as well he killed a hundred people now then after some time he was overcome with remorse and regret so then he went back to the people and asked them regarding the most knowledgeable person of the land and then they directed him towards an alim who was actually a learned person so then he went to the learned person and he said that he had killed a hundred people can he do tawbah in other words will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive him if he turns back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this alim replied yes he said yes what's standing in your way what's there between you and between tawbah or what's between him and between tawbah what's preventing the person but then the alim also gave him some extra advice and the alim then said to him go to such and such a land in that land there are people who worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala go to that land and you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that land as well and do not return back to your land do not turn back to your town do not turn back to your town why because it's uh, the, the hadith wording is that فَإِنَّهَا أَرْضُ سُوء it's a evil land it's a bad place don't come back go back to go to the place of the men of Allah and then do not return back to your hometown or where you are from so he leaves, he reaches half of the path, so he travels, he leaves his hometown to go to this place and he reaches halfway, then what happens? Death comes to him. Does he die? That's a discussion we'll, we'll speak of inshallah. Death comes to him, then the angels of punishment come to seize his soul. But as well as that, the angels of mercy come to, seal his, uh, to seize his soul as well. Then there's a disagreement between the angels. The angels of punishment are saying, he's never done a good deed in his life. He has never done, إِنَّهُ لَمْ يَعْمَلْ خَيْرًا قَطْتُ He has never done a good deed in his life. So we're going to seize his soul. But then the angels of mercy, they reply, he was coming, having repented and turning to Allah with his heart. So this was a disagreement between the two angels or the two groups of angels. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then sent a third angel in the form of a human being. And then this angel was made the judge between the two. This angel was made a judge between the two. And the narration now breaks up into two or three different narrations at this point. This narration that we've been reading, the angel said to the two groups, measure the distance between the two lands. Whichever land he is closer to, he will, ju he will be judged accordingly. 
whichever land he'll be uh, closer to, he'll be judged accordingly. So he had reached halfway. So the angels then measured the land and they realized that he is closer to the land of the men of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the angels of mercy then took his soul. In the second narration, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the land which was close to him, which is his homeland, become far. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the land of his destination, the land of the men of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala become far and that land then moved further away from him. And then it was commanded, measure the distance. And when they measured the distance, he was فَوَجَدُوهُ إِلَى هَذِهِ أَقْرَبْ بِشِبْرٍ He was closer to the land of the men of Allah by a hand span. And because of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave his sins and the angels of mercy seized his soul. Now this is the hadith we've mentioned and we translated. This hadith is narrated by Sayyiduna Abu Sa'id Sa'ad bin Malik bin Sinan al-Khudri radiyallahu ta'ala anhu who is more commonly known as Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. Very briefly, this Sahabi, this companion himself Sa'ad bin Malik himself was a Sahabi and his father Malik bin Sinan was also a Sahabi. So when you mention a Sahabi's name whose father is also a Sahabi, uh, Ibn Allan mentions that you should mention radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with both of them. Anhuma. If it's just one male, anhu, one female, anha, two anhuma, male or female, plural anhum, plural female anhunna. So that's a point that's mentioned. Every commentary that you'll read where a Sahabi is mentioned whose father was also a Sahabi, they'll mention, you should say, radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma. Regarding him, his father uh, was made shaheed in the battle of Uhud. His father was made shaheed in the battle of Uhud. So his father has a very high rank. The Sahaba who were martyred in the battle of Uhud have extremely high rank amongst the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum ajma'een. He himself narrated many hadith. Uh, Ibn Allan mentions approximately 1170 hadith are narrated by uh, Sayyiduna Sa'ad bin Malik radiyallahu an. How many? 1170 hadith. He is known as uh, one of his titles Afqah, when he passed away, which means the most intelligent, the most well versed in the law of Islam. When he passed away, then the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, or the Tabi'een, then said, the, the um, Afqah of Sahaba, Afqah of Sahaba, the most knowledgeable of Islamic law from the Sahaba has passed away, radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa an abihi. That's just very brief um, tarjama of this Sahabi. Now moving on to this uh, narration. A couple of points we learn from this narration. First and foremost, this is the wa'az of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ is delivering a message to the Sahaba. We understand the beautiful method by means of which the Prophet ﷺ would teach the Sahaba and deliver the message. So his hadith, his words ﷺ were not as simple as don't do this, do this, you shouldn't do this, this will happen, you shouldn't do this, this will happen. The Prophet ﷺ's technique of tabligh, of spreading the message of Islam was a very beautiful technique. Here we see the Prophet ﷺ is using hikayah, is using stories to deliver his message. What's the message? Imam al nawawi has placed this story, has placed his hadith in the chapter of Tawbah. So according to Imam al nawawi one of the main messages of the story is Tawbah. But look how beautifully the Prophet ﷺ is presenting this in the form of a story. It's mentioned that Al Hikaya Jundun Min Junudillah. The story is a army from the armies of Allah. Why? Because this, when the story is mentioned, it's easier to, to learn, it's easier to memorize. It's, uh, those uh, 
specialists who teach techniques to memorize, strategies to memorize, they mention stories. If you want to memorize something, put it into a story. It'll be easier to memorize. So here, the Prophet ﷺ is using a story, and in other hadiths, is using stories to deliver the message. Why? It's easier to memorize the story. How many uh, times do we hear the story uh, from the Noble Quran, the story of the great prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And you can memorize the story listening to it once. So that's the hikmah, the wisdom of mentioning stories. So we should learn them and utilize them in our tabliq. When we invite people to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we advise people, our brothers and our sisters in the deen, there's an excellent technique to place a story within the narration. There was a muhaddith from Al-Maghrib, from Morocco. He was once teaching hadith. I think he was teaching Bukhari, Al-Jami al-Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari. As he was teaching the hadith, he closed the book of hadith. And then he started to mention a story. Now the student mentions, he narrates this and he says, when my teacher closed the book of hadith and started mentioning the story, I thought to myself, you've closed the book of hadith to mention a story. You closed the book of hadith to mention a story. And as I was thinking this, my teacher turned to me and he said, al hikayatu jundun min junudillah, stories are army from the armies of Allah. Meaning this is a technique, a method of doing tabligh, of passing the message of the deen. And this is a method that the Prophet ﷺ utilized. And you can probably right now think of so many hadith where the Prophet ﷺ is mentioning a story in his hadith. And we'll see this inshallah in uh, the Riyadh al-Salihin. We'll, we'll see many hadith where the Prophet ﷺ is mentioning a wa'az, a point of admonition, but in the style of story. This also takes us on to another point. The Prophet ﷺ is mentioning a story of a person from a previous nation. From which we understand, we the believers, the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ have been given permission by the Prophet ﷺ to narrate stories from the previous nations provided they do not go against our deen and our principles. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned stories of the previous nations and in hadith the Prophet ﷺ actually allowed Sahaba and the Muslims to mention what are called Israeliyat, Israeliyat, stories of the previous nations or specifically stories of Banu Israel which do not contradict our deen, do not contradict our laws, our belief in order to pass the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forward. We've, co we've mentioned a number of hadiths already and inshallah many more to come. <coughs> For example, the woman from the Banu Israel, she was a, a, in the hadiths mentioned she was a woman who would do haram, she would sell her body. Such a great um, sin, disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave her. Why? What was the reason? That one day she was leaving um, the well or the stream after performing ghusl, after bathing herself. And then there was a thirsty dog. There was a dog that was thirsty. What did she do? She climbed back into the well or she went back to the stream and she took off her hoof her sock and she filled it up with water and then she brought it back to the dog so the dog can drink the water. This deed of hers was so beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave her sins. This is a story from where? From Bani Israel, from the stories of the chronicles of the children of Israel. So that's another point we learn from this hadith. The first person that this murderer approached, that this person who had killed 99 people, was Rahib. Was a man who worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but had no knowledge, but did not have knowledge. The second person he went to was a man of knowledge, an alim. So here in this hadith we have a clear contrast between a man who worshipped Allah and did not have knowledge, and a man of knowledge. The previous hadith, hadith number 19, we spoke about the virtue of knowledge, 
where the Sahabi said to the person who came to question him regarding the, the wiping over the footgear that the angels spread out their wings beneath the feet of the student of knowledge. This is the, a beautiful connection between the two hadiths. That hadith and this hadith teach us the virtue of knowledge and the virtue of the knowledgeable person over the less knowledgeable person. In Nuzhat uh, al-Muttaqeen, the common commentators mention, this hadith shows us فضل العلم مع قلة العبادة على كثرة العبادة مع الجهل The virtue of knowledge with less worship over more worship with less knowledge. The virtue of less worship with knowledge over a lot of worship with less knowledge. What happened to the first person? His ignorance, he was a worshipful servant, he worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but due to his ignorance, what happened? Uh, uh, both commentaries that I've used mention, halaka wa ahlaka. He destroyed himself and he destroyed somebody else. Because of his ignorance, he was destroyed. How? He was killed. And he destroyed others. Why? He was answering questions without knowledge. His ignorance led to his own downfall and the downfall of the people. But what happened to the alim? With his knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept him alive and kept others alive as well. Ibn Jawzi, Abdul Rahman al Jawzi rahimahullah ta'ala mentions in Talbis Iblis a very beautiful story which shows you the difference between a knowledgeable person and a person without knowledge. He says, <coughs> That once shaitan was sitting on his uh, seat and there's a, a appointed time where his minions, the shayateen, the minions come to him and the minions inform him of what they've done. And then he encourages them and he says, well done. So that the majlis started, the gathering started and shaitan sitting on his seat and his minions are in, all in front of him. One comes forward and he says, I made X steel. Shaitan says, very good, well done. Then another one comes forward and he says, I made this person do this. For example, I made uh, Zaid uh, uh, shout at his mom and dad. Very good, well done. Shaitan is saying to his children, to his minions, well done. You made this child disobedient to his mom and dad. You made this child answer back his mom and dad, swear at his mom and dad, even hit his mom and dad, well done. Another one comes, I made this person steal and uh, fraud people. Well done. One comes and he says that there was a, a boy going to the school and I stopped him from going to school. There's a boy going to the madrasa, the Islamic school, to gain Islamic education, knowledge of Islam or knowledge of deen, knowledge of the law of Allah. And I stopped him. There was a playground and I said to him, go over there. And then he went to the playground and he didn't go to class. Shaitan became really happy. Shaitan left his seat, went to him and hugged him. The others saw this and the others got jealous. That said, he made a child not go to school and you've hugged him. I made X kill Y. You, you, all you said was well done. <laughs> so then Shaitan said, let me tell you what he has done. Let me show you what he has done. Shaitan said to his minions, take me to a village where there's a knowledgeable person and a jahil, abid, a worshipful person who worships Allah but has no knowledge of the religion of Allah. Take me to a village like this. So they took him to a village. Shaitan said to his minions, all of you hide, watch. <coughs> Shaitan disguises himself as an old man and is walking in the street. And the Abid comes, the, the man who worships Allah but has no knowledge. He comes, Shaitan then stops him. Shaitan then stops him. And Shaitan, so the old man stops him. The old man says to him, uh, you know, I need something, I need your help. So the Abid, the worshipful servant stops and he says, what do you need? He says, I have a question. What's your question? Shaitan, in one story he may mentions, he pulls out an egg. In another story, he takes out a needle. Let's use the egg. He takes out the egg and he says to the servant, Tell me, if Allah Almighty wants, 
Can he place all of this world into this small egg? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, can he place this whole world into this egg? <coughs> and the Abid said, what are you talking about? How is this possible? Are you crazy? And then he left him. <laughs> what are you talking about? Are you crazy? Meaning, in other words, how can Allah do this? Allah can't do that. Put the whole world into this small egg. Shaitan said, you carry on. So he left. And then the alim is now crossing. So then the knowledgeable person, the person who has studied Islam, who knows his beliefs, knows his practices, knows his characteristics that Islam teaches, he knows this well. The alim crosses a shaitan. The old man comes and he stops him and he says, I need your help. The alim stops. What do you need? I have a question. What's your question? Takes out the egg. And he says, can Allah put all of this world into this small egg? The alim turns to him and says, you must be shaitan. <laughs> you must be shaitan. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, he can take many worlds like this world and place it into this one egg. And then the, the then shaitan says, okay, that's fine. And then, then the alim goes and then shaitan comes back to his minions and he says, do you see? That man, the first one, worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala day and night, but he does not know his beliefs regarding Allah. And now he is doomed. He is doomed. He denied the power of Allah. He is doomed. He is in the carry on worshipping Allah with no knowledge. But the alim, this knowledgeable person, is very dangerous. The hadith of the Prophet sallallahu an alim is more weighty on shaitan than 70 abids. Shaitan struggles to move an alim, to trick an alim. And it takes him 70 times more effort than he would with an abid. There's a hadith of the Prophet. So of course shaitan's going to be happy. Yes, one person has not gone to madrasa. One person has stopped gaining sacred knowledge. Why? Had he gained that sacred knowledge, had he reached that level, he would be 70 times stronger on me than the average person. So this shows us the... The, the difference between worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without knowledge and then worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with knowledge. And I mentioned this before, when we speak about the knowledge of the deen, the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam teaches us that our deen, the knowledge of our deen, when you want to judge yourself regarding your knowledge of your deen, think about three things. Your knowledge regarding your creed, your belief in Allah, the angels, the books, the prophets, the messengers, heaven, hell, the day, day, day of judgment, the dururiyat, the necessities. Number two, the practices, knowledge of the laws of salah, the laws of saum, of hajj, of zakat, of tahara. And then number three, knowledge of akhlaq, knowledge of character, knowledge of tazkiyatul nafs, of cleansing the inner self from the amradul qulub, from the illnesses of the heart. These are the three dimensions of the study of Islam. So that's one beautiful point we learn from uh, this hadith. And of course, from this hadith, this man who had killed 99 people and then killed 100 people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave him. In the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave him. Meaning the, the door of Tawbah is always open. The door of Tawbah is always open. Do not ever be hopeless of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not ever let the waswasa of shaitan, the evil whisper of shaitan say to you, how are you turning back to Allah? Look at the bad that you've done. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave a man who killed a hundred people. This is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not let shaitan trick you. Do not let shaitan say to you, look at what you've done all your life. Look at what this man done all his life. The angels of punishment said he did not do a good deed in his entire life. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave him. So this hadith teaches us not to be hopeless of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always be hopeful of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The door of Allah, the door of repentance is opened.
in the previous uh, number of hadith we've seen the door of the repentance this door for you to turn back to Allah is open all the way up until the Sun will rise from the West meaning the day of judgment all the way up until your your soul will leave your body the door of mercy is opened for you and for this man the door of mercy was opened for him even even up until this point even up until this point before I continue, a question may enter your mind. How is he forgiven? Hundred people he's killed. At the start of this chapter, we said the sins are two types. Sin, which is between a person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number two, a sin which is between the person and Allah. And it's uh, related to a person of Allah, to khalq. So this is a different type of sin. He is dis he is killed a human being, 99 humans. How can he, how can he repent to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala? <coughs> One answer is his repentance to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is his sin. Can his sin be forgiven? And the answer is yes, his sin can be forgiven. But we mentioned at the start of this chapter, if a sin is related to a person, you must also fulfill the right of that person. So if the right of the people is that he pays blood money to those people, as well as repenting to Allah, he needs to pay blood money to the people. Or if the right of the people is the death penalty, capital punishment, he must accept that I have repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but for those people to forgive me, I need to give my life. He needs to be ready to give his life as well. If he doesn't, if he says, I'll take that punishment and I will not repent to Allah. If he dies without repenting to Allah, then he will be questionable in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if he dies in the court of, if he dies having repented to Allah without trying to fulfill the rights he has broken, then this is where Al-Hafidh uh, Ibn Kamal Pasha rahimahullah ta'ala says that if he repents to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then he dies, then he dies, then this is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, he may please his opponents, the people whose right he has broken. There is a hadith where on the day of judgment two people will rise who had animosity against one another. They are good people, but they had animosity against one another. And they will rise. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to them, the overview of the hadith is that you can enter paradise, but there's only one thing stopping you, is that you need to make up with one another. And at that point, after the mahshar, the land of the day of judgment, Jannah is in front of them, all they have to do is forgive one another. For at that point, regardless of what the person's done, that's fine, you're forgiven. If all I have to do to get to Jannat is to forgive you, then you're forgiven for every single thing that you've done. So Ibn Kamal says, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, he will please the people whose right he has broken on the day of judgment. And if he doesn't, compensate for this on the day of judgment. He will have to compensate for this on the day of judgment. <coughs> so the point is, the door of Tawbah is always open. The door of Tawbah is always open. Another point from this hadith. When the scholar, the alim, said to him, Yes, Allah, you can do Tawbah. Such a person can do Tawbah. But then he gave him advice after this. What was that advice? That there is a land where people are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Go to that land. Go to that land and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there as well. And do not turn back to your land. Do not turn back to the land where you've come from. Why it is an evil land. In this hadith, not only do we learn that the doors of Tawbah are open. But when we do Tawbah, we need to be... Th think, have foresight with our Tawbah. I am doing Tawbah, but I need to take precautions as well. So yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you 
Your tawbah is acceptable if you turn to him properly, but take a precaution. For you the precaution is leave this land. Go to the land of the men of Allah and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there. So if we repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from a sin, we also need to take precautions to avoid that sin. For example, I'm not going to look at haram anymore. I'm not going to look at women with the lustful desire. I do true tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah forgive me for this. I will not do this again. But I'm not deleting my Instagram. But I'm not going to lower my gaze. Then what precaution have you taken? What precaution have you taken? Oh Allah forgive me. I'm still going to look around. But I'm not going to look lustfully. So take precaution when you do tawbah. Oh Allah, forgive me for missing Salatul Fajr. I'll pray Salatul Fajr. But then went out for a meal with my mates. Got back home 12. Went to sleep at 2. Fajr's in 2 hours. What precaution have you taken? So when you repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from a disobedience, also take precautions to help yourself fulfill your tawbah. To help yourself fulfill that deed. And one of the ways that this hadith teaches us of taking precaution is mujanabatu ahlil ma'asi to turn away from the people of sin. If you are in a company and this company is encouraging you to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If your company is pushing you towards the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then leave such company. Ma damu ala halihim for as long as they are on that state. If you have friends and your friends are pushing you towards the evil, your friends are pushing you towards disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then leave such a circle. Now I can't leave them. I've known them for 10 years. I've known them for 15 years. I've known them since nursery. How can I leave them? Well, you've left Allah for them. You've left Allah for them. Cannot you leave them for Allah? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Pray Salah. My friends are going to say, you've become Mulvi, Mulvi Sahib. Prayed one namaz, become Mulvi Sahib. But even then, this phrase people use this as an insult, Astaghfirullah, this should not take place. But nevertheless, do not forsake Allah because of friendship. Because the greatest of friends is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the Noble Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a type of person who will be punished in Jahannam. And he will say, she will say, Ya laytani lam attakhid fulanan khalila. Ya laytani lam attakhid. If only I did not take fulanan, that person khalila as a friend. If only that person wasn't my friend. The person will be thrown into Jahannam and he will say, If only I did not make you my friend. If only I did not know you. If only you weren't my friend. But remember, in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لَا تَزِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وِزْرَ أُخْرَى No bearer will bear the burden of another bearer. No bearer will bear the burden of another person. So you can say all you want on the Day of Judgment, Oh Allah, Him, He's the one who made me do this. No, you done this yourself. You cannot blame anyone but yourself. So on the Day of Judgment, there's no friendship. On the Day of Judgment, there's no friendship. The Day of Judgment is a day a man will run away from his brother. In fact, he will run away from his own mother and father. He will run away from his own mother and father. And you're saying, friends? What are friends? A friend who turns you away from Allah is no friend. That is no friend at all. Imam Ghazali in Bidayatul Hidayah, the beginning of guidance, a, a, bu a, a beautiful book, he mentions friendship. When you look at a friend, what should you look at? Number one, Imam Ghazali says, 
Look, is he a man of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not? Is he a, a person or she a person who will remind me of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not? And then he continues with the other things that you should look at in a friend. So from this hadith we understand that if you, if you have to leave your friends for the sake of Allah, then so be it. I will leave them. Why? For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is very important, especially for students in secondary school in this day and age. Secondary school is a time where many people start smoking, many people start using and abusing drugs, many Muslims start abusing drugs, many Muslims start drinking alcohol, many Muslims get into all sorts of haram. But in that age, you're at an age, when you're older, in your 20s, mid 20s, it's slightly different. Peer pressure does not affect you as much. But at that age, peer pressure has a huge impact on the person. So you remind yourself, especially if you're at that age, that I will not leave Allah for these people. I will not disobey Allah and make Allah upset so that these people can say, yeah, you're one of us. Now you can hang around with us. I will not leave Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for such people. If Allah asks me on the day of judgment, Oh my slave, what did you do for me? I will say, Oh Allah, I left all of my friends just for you. Imagine saying that. Oh Allah, I, I, you know, kids and uh, the different types of insults they have for each other. You're a loner. You're a loner. No one's hanging around with you. But you can say on the Day of Judgment, Oh Allah, I became a loner just for you. <laughs> oh Allah, I became a loner just for you. Every person that I knew, all my friends were doing X, Y and Z. And I left them. Why? The fear that I might do what they're doing as well. A lot of people think I'm not doing that. But that's how it starts. That's how it starts. So from this hadith we understand to break yourself away from the environment which pushes you to sin. Break yourself away from the environment which push it pushes you towards sin. But not only break yourself away from the environment which push pushes you towards sin, go towards that environment which pushes you towards good deeds. Place yourself into a good environment which pushes you towards good deeds, which makes you want to do more and more good deeds. For this person in the hadith, that environment was the land where the people were worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The shaykh, the alim said to him, go to that land and with those people, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With those people, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Noble Quran mentions يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله أو you who believe اتقوا الله be conscious of Allah اتقوا الله fear Allah اتقوا الله remember Allah وكونوا مع الصادقين and and be with the truthful people وكونوا مع الصادقين and be with the truthful people i.e. the righteous people so be with the righteous people. And that was the advice that was given to this man. Don't, don't just leave your land and just be empty. Go to a good environment. Go to good people and be with them. And be with them. In the narration, the wording of the hadith, if you look at the hadith, the wording of the hadith is that the, the land is described as good or bad. The land is described as good or bad. That your land is a bad land. Ard su. And go to such and such a land. Ibn Allan, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentions a very beautiful point. He says the land is not good. <laughs> How is land good? This is majaz isnadi. This is majaz, is a metaphorical usage of the word in the Arabic language. Just like we say, for example, you say, I drank the cup. You don't drink the cup. You drink the water inside the cup. So likewise, go to the land. The land is good or the land is bad. 
the land's not good, the land isn't bad, but the people on the land are good and the people on the land are bad. And that's why he, he says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala Fihi Ima'un Fihi Ima'u Anna Sharaf al Makan bi Sharaf al Makin. In this hadith there is an indication that the honor of the residence is due to the honor of the resident. The honor of the residence is due to the honor of the resident. The poet said, By the inhabitant of the place, does the place become valuable or cheap? Because of the person in the house, the house becomes valuable or the house becomes cheap. Another poet says, the love of the land has not encapsulated my heart. The love of the land has not encapsulated my heart, but rather the love of the one who lives in that land. We do not love Medina because it is Medina. We do not love Medina because it is Medina. We love Medina because of the one who resides in Medina. Sallallahu mm -hmm. alayhi wa sallam. So this land has been known as an evil land because of the people and the land has been known as a good land because of the people of that land. So not only must you take the precaution in the sense of this associating from an environment which will push you towards evil, but now associate yourself with the people of Allah. Associate yourself with the places of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there are baraka in, there is baraka in these places in these places are blessings where these people are present there are blessings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where are these places the masajid the masajid the house of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a place it's mentioned that there are three fortresses against shaitan there are three fortresses against shaitan number 1 the remembrance of Allah. When you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are in a fortress, you are in a castle. Shaitan cannot attack you. Shaitan finds it difficult to attack you. Number two, reciting the Quran with tadabbur, with reflection. When you recite the Quran and reflect on the Quran, you are in a fortress, you are in a castle. Shaitan will find it hard to attack you. And number three, the masjid. The house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you step foot into the house of Allah, you are in a fortress from the fortresses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So be amongst the good, go to the good land. Where is that good land that we can go to? Come to the masjid. Come to the masjid at prayer time. Spend time in the masjid. More time that you can spend, the better it will be for you. But this is good company. The brothers, mashallah, today is a Friday night. Where are people on Friday nights? You may have many invitations tonight. Come, let's go to eat. Come for this, come for that. But you left everything and came here. Why? For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At this point, it's very hard for shaitan to put an evil thought into your mind to do an evil right now. Whereas if you are somewhere else, it may have been easier for shaitan to make you do uh, uh, evil deed and disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This man, we're coming to the end now. I wasn't planning on spending so much time on this hadith. But this hadith is so common, so well known. You'll hear this time and time again. And it'll be good to know this this commentary in this depth. So when you hear the hadith again, all of this commentary, inshallah, will come back. Which angels came when the person died? The angels of mercy and the angels of? How did the angels of punishment know that this person deserves punishment? Because what was he doing throughout his life? Sinning. He did not do a good deed in his life, they said. But how did the angels of mercy know to come? What good did he do? He repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he didn't do anything 
There's no mention in the hadith of him actually doing anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave special knowledge to the angels that this servant of mine has repented. In Nushatul Muttaqeen, the commentators mention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the tawbah of his servant so much. Loves the tawbah of the servant so much. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will express pride, express happiness on the, uh, from the tawbah of his servant to his angels. When a servant returns back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will express his happiness to his angels. Look, my servant has come back to me. Look, my servant has returned back to me. This is the love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for the servant that returns back. Have we mentioned a hadith which also depicts the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the repenting servant? Do you remember the hadith? The man who is on the conveyance in a desert land, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more happy with his repenting. And in that hadith we mentioned the mother, how happy the mother will be with the child that turns back to the door. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is even more happy with the servant that turns back to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are some more points from this hadith, but I think this is sufficient. A commentary on this hadith. This hadith is a very beautiful hadith of Tawbah and the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the servants. How much does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala love us if we realize how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us? How much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is completely independent of us when we say in our salah, Allahu samad. Allah is independent. When we realize how independent Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is of us, and regardless of this independence, He continues to shower His blessings upon us. This discussion of the love of Allah and the showering of blessings will appear in the chapter of shukr, the chapter of thankfulness and gratitude. So I don't want to uh, go into that too much. But I'll conclude with the same narration I concluded with last time Ma aflaha man aflaha illa bi suhbati man aflaha A successful person has not succeeded except by being in the company of a successful person A man of Allah has not become a man of Allah except by being in the company of a man of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to truly turn back to him and reconnect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.